So, Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, could you just kick us off by telling us a little bit about your background and what you do today? Well, I guess most important is my training and the work that I do in my daily life. I'm a forage agronomist. I'm a ruminant nutritionist by training. I currently work to support agriculture uh, by working for a forage seed company. So seeds that we would use for pasture, hay, or silage crops. Um, over the years, I've developed an advocacy for ruminant animal agriculture and ruminant animal products in human health and flourishing. I've had my own personal health journey that led me to do a deep dive into human nutrition and question a lot of what we were told. And so over the years, I've kind of developed this role of being a bridge between the metabolic health communities and human nutrition and fitness on that side and agriculture on the other side, because I think we have a lot to learn from each other. Yeah, I would massively agree with you there. And and when you say ruminants, we're mostly talking about cows there? Well, cows are certainly one of the ruminants, but sheep, goats, deer, bison, buffalo, elk, uh, these are the animals that because of their multi-compartmented stomachs, their pre-gastric fermentation type of digestion, they are able to take high fiber, low fat, Low, poor protein quality or poor quality protein diets and upcycle them, utilize those as feed resources and provide us with highest quality nutrient dense foods like meat and milk, mm -hmm. as well as many other benefits. So you don't subscribe to the, the angle that you can be as healthy as a human could be on a on a plant-based diet well there's a couple things i push back um you know humans are remarkably adaptive and over the course of our experience on this earth we've eaten anything that hasn't eaten us first so <laughs> you know we we have that capability i think it's it should not be controversial that um animal source foods are the best source of many essential nutrients and in some cases the only source of those essential nutrients so some amount of animal source food i believe is essential for proper human development function and health and that becomes particularly uh, critical at certain stages like in utero early development, and then we're coming to understand uh, it later in life for healthy aging. So not, you know, meat is an animal source food. <laughs> it's not the only one. Mm -hmm. And if someone chooses not to eat red meat for whatever reason, I, first of all, have no desire to tell anybody what they need to eat. Um, on the other hand, I think that the complete exclusion of all animal source foods is probably not viable long term. And we have a lot of evidence about how that causes harm to human beings. Mm -hmm. The second point I'd make is that humanity's diet is already plant based. Um, if you look across the globe or even in high income countries alone, the majority of calories in the diets across those countries is coming from plant source foods. And as we should know by now, a calorie from a plant source food doesn't have the same metabolic effect as a calorie coming from animal source foods. Mm. Um, and then if you look at protein quality, which is a topic that we could get into later, um, the vast majority of protein in humanity's diet is coming from plant source foods already. And the, the more sophistication that we deploy to look at protein nutrition, the more likely it is that we're actually having protein malnutrition globally across low, middle, 
and high income countries. So we're already plant based. In low and middle income countries, the vast majority of protein in humanity's diet is coming from plants. And in the high income countries, it's not, you know, it, 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 we're pretty close. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like something like 60 some percent comes from animal source. Mm -hmm. But when you then dig in and look at the, anim the plant source foods that are making up our diet, it's poor quality protein. So there's some issues there. And then you can get into groups where for whatever reason, access or choice for mm -hmm. animal source food is restricted. So now you, uh, I have no problem imagining some limitations of mm -hmm. indispensable amino acids. And, and I just want um, to, sorry, sorry to drop in there, like in terms of what you're saying about low quality protein, the thing that springs to my mind is bioavailability. Can you just talk us through like what you mean by poor quality protein? Because a lot of people see as protein as protein as protein, you know, 18 grams of protein in a plant based cereal bar is 18 grams of protein. So th that's not the case. No, we don't. Uh, protein is an oversimplified term. There's lots of good reasons why we got there. But if if you look in any table of fee food values or on an app that's tracking what you're consuming or on a food label, when they list protein, that's a shortened version of crude protein. And crude protein is estimated by determining the nitrogen content in a sample and multiplying that sample by 6.25, assuming that all the nitrogen that was in that sample was in protein and that protein was 16% nitrogen. This is done on a dry matter basis. So that works and has worked since the 18, late 1800s um relatively inexpensive so we've got lots of data problem is human beings need amino acids we and and particularly we need those amino acids that we cannot make ourselves um and then even some of the amino acids that we can make there's evidence to suspect that we can't make enough if like we were on some completely artificial diet where that amino acid wasn't present at all. So um, that those indispensable amino acids uh, need to be present. They need to be available. So just because it's in a food doesn't mean we can access them. And then they need to be absorbable in the proper amounts relative to each other is, so, this, is that testable as well could you could you do a test on the protein and see which what the amino acid content is that work is being done um, there's a more uh, uh, current assessment called dias d-i-a-a-s digestible indispensable amino acid score mm -hmm. um, it's not a trivial thing you need, um, it, for the most part, they're using ileal cannulated swine as a model. Um, they have to know exactly what's in the feed going in. <clears throat> then they can pull this sample of the digesta as it passes from the small to the large intestine and see what's left. So far, far it, too complicated to, to do on a large scale. Well, uh, yeah, it's hard to find human volunteers for this kind of work, <laughs> yeah. um, but it's being done and mm. it needs to be done, especially when we get in these areas where the diets are marginal. Mm. So, for example, if um, cereals make up the largest single source of protein, in quotes, in humanity's diet, and wheat is the single largest source so cereals provide more protein in humanity's diet than all animal source foods combined. Um, wheat is a, a poor source of lysine. When we bake things out of it, we decrease the digestibility of that or the availability of that lysine. And if we make things really brown and crispy, then that lysine becomes almost completely unavailable. 
And so now you have a situation where, depending on the analysis you use, yeah, it's got lysine, but it's not available. Mm. You know, if it's a breakfast cereal, I don't endorse breakfast cereal, but let's just talk about that. Mm. And it's a wheat cereal, a wheat flake, and you're putting real dairy on it then the real dairy can provide enough lysine to make up for that deficit. Mm. But now if you're putting some plant or nut juice on instead, we don't have any idea. And so the more artificial uh, these diets become, the more this needs to be taken Mm. into account. And I'm pretty sure it hasn't been. They have done work to look at the, um, the plant pucks, you know, the impossible and beyond burgers. Mm. Oh yeah. And, and so pea protein is a, it does not the pea protein extract, which the beyond burger is built around, doesn't qualify for a protein quality claim. So they can't say by regulation that impossible burger is a good source of protein. They can say that, about the impossible burger because it's built on soy okay but as soon as you put that in between two wheat buns Mm. and who's going to eat it by itself um when you do that then as a meal the puck doesn't have enough lysine to make up for the lack of lysine in the wheat bun and so as a meal it doesn't qualify as a good source of protein so so why did why does soy qualify as a better source of protein than um than pea protein because of its um the amount and the ratio of amino acids that it provides okay so um but you know soy has some limitations in terms of where it can be produced and mm. not everybody wants to consume it and mm. th- those sorts of things but uh, just from a raw sort of content basis when we say good source that that's what it's referring mm. to i mean the, the interesting thing is that we hear so much certainly in the in the sort of legacy media about not only is meat and particularly ruminants and, and cows in particular damaging for the environment, that eliminating that from our diet is also healthier for us. So how have we got to the point where we're in basically opposite world? Yeah. Well, I, I, I know that you spoke with Belinda Fetke recently. So there's one explanation that I'd refer to. <laughs> there's a long history mm-hmm. of people who, for whatever reason, believe this and then set about proving that their belief was right. Uh, And this was in the face of um, a a friend of mine, um, uh, Adele Height, sadly passed too soon. Um, Put it this way, she said, "At, at, at, at a point, human nutrition shifted from ensuring adequate essential nutrition to nutritional epidemiology of chronic disease. And that wasn't a trivial transition, right? And, and as long as people were focusing on providing adequate essential nutrition, mm. then animal source foods were a fundamental part of the diet and, and all of the things that you would worry about in terms of you know, affordability and accessibility and appropriate to whatever person's background um, were, were in play. But there was no question that you know, people needed, you know, your daily meds, meat, eggs, dairy, seafood, pick whatever is appropriate. Um, Then you got into this whole mythology that we could adequately estimate what people consume when they're free living. (laughs) And we could quantify what it is that they're eating, right? So Mm. you're going to try to remember what you eat on a daily basis. And then I'm going to go to some table of values, and I'm going to bring those in. And then over years, we're going to see what you, you know, what diseases you contract. Mm. And then we're going to try to make some meaningful statistical relationship. Well, it's a completely fraught experience, but it's the basis of modern dietary guidelines and advice. Mm. And everyone understands, anyone who's involved in that understands the limitations Um, to the point where we now have, um, as as you've 
sort of alluded to, we have the series of papers that come out in the Annals of Internal Medicine, where they basically say, you know, with weakest quality evidence, which is the only evidence available <laughs> to us, um, there is no there is no basis for a reduction in consumption of red meat from present levels. Mm. And, and the only reason they don't say anything about increasing is nobody's ever thought about increasing intake. So nobody's ever done that work. So there is no, you know, evidence in, in the literature, at least that, you know, I, I could point to right now. So we, we have this narrative. There was, you know, the environmental movement played a part in this, uh, again, beginning in the late 60s and early 70s. You, you had Paul Ehrlich's population bomb coming out in the late, you know, uh, 60s. You have Diet for a Small Planet coming out in the early 70s. They cited the Diet for a Small Planet and the Dietary Goals, the Senate report, subcommittee report. I mean, they quoted it as if it was authoritative, and that's part of, we get this idea of, well, if you just combine these protein sources, mm. then you can meet your protein needs. Well, not so fast. You have to do it at every meal. You have to do mm. it properly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then if you're raising children, they just can't eat enough of these plant source foods. Mm. Uh, the one example that comes to my mind from a conversation with a researcher is an eight-year-old boy physically could not eat enough rice and lentils to meet his lysine requirements if wow. he had unlimited access, wow. just physical gut size. And then think about what he's also getting, you know, a load of fiber, a load of carbohydrate, a load of phytate, mm. a load of all these anti-nutrients. Mm. Um, so, so you, you, you had this belief system that goes back many, many, many years that influenced the development of nutrition. You had the environmental, uh, movement that came along and adopted this as a, as a something to push. You, you also had a social movement where people were rebelling against the idea of sitting down for the family meal, mm. you know, family became, so all of these played a part. Also in the seventies, beef got really, really expensive. And one of the things that McGovern's committee was pushing back against was the cost of meat. And, and so, you know, this, all of these factors swirled around and, mm -hmm. you know, years, and, and then you have commercial interests, right? If I can make a product that can take commodity mm -hmm. and process it and sell it in the market at a higher margin than I could the commodities, hey, presto, now we've got mm -hmm. a marketing campaign. Yep. And um, then on top of that, we've got uh, medical and pharmaceutical interests that are interested in, you know, their products in the marketplace. So all of that combined, mm. I think makes a really toxic um, uh, product that today, you know, we find people promoting vegan diets for children when we have um, national organizations that are saying, no, this is not appropriate. Mm. This is, you, you know, children will, and, and in fact, we have people doing work in low and middle income countries where they are economically not able to access mm. the animal source food that they need. And we're seeing rates of stunting in some mm. countries and some regions exceeding 40% wow. of children five and under, but globally it's between a fifth and a quarter of those children mm. are stunted, which is, not only stature, it's cognitive development. Mm. Their brains are not developing properly and they won't be able to make that mm. up. So that will last for their lifetime. But that, that seems to be an absolutely crucial issue. I mean, there's a few things in there that I wanted to touch on. Like you mentioned the seventies when the escalation of the meat price, it sounds, it feels like we're going through something very similar at the moment in terms of inflation, cost of inputs, cost of fertilizers, cost of feed, everything is getting more expensive, which is pushing up these meat costs as well as increasing taxation on meat or certainly taxation coming down the road on meat. But you're talking about these, these government 
uh, the, these national bodies that are talking about vegan diets not being safe for children, I, I don't hear their voices very loud at all. I don't hear this. I don't hear the the pushback on the the anti meat agenda very loud at all. Well, they're smart in that they're using the phrase plant based, mm. which when I hear that, I convert that through my filters to vegan, right? Yeah. That, and, and, mm. you know, if we look across the scope of human dietary patterns, it seems to me there, you have three options. You can be vegan, that is, you exclude all animal source food. You can be carnivore, that is, you exclude all plant source food, or you can be an omnivore. <laughs> And that by the tech, by the classic definition, a vegetarian is an omnivore that doesn't eat red meat, but you're still eating eggs, dairy, seafood. Hmm. Uh, people think of populations in India being vegetarian, but they eat dairy. Hmm. They, you know, they, they eat other animal source food. They don't eat red meat. Okay, hmm. fine. You know, hmm. and other populations, they don't eat pork. Okay, fine. Hmm. Um, so so we're playing games in even i don't know if if belinda mentioned this but even the seventh day adventists play games with words mm, like yeah. you know you can be a vegan and only eat meat once a month yeah if you mentioned that yeah, yeah so they can leverage can a, that to, to have yeah. better health yeah yeah exactly so maybe that's enough to avoid the overt you know mm. symptoms mm. um plus whatever supplements that they're taking but um, as, as one source said, 95% of the world's vegetarians are economic vegetarians. They're not philosophic vegetarian. Wow. Wow. 90, 95%. Yeah, that's, that was the figure. And so mm -hmm. one of the ideas I got from somebody in the energy space was that you can have two primary sort of focuses you can be focusing on um, maximizing human flourishing or minimizing human impact. Those are the two. And so if your goal is, you know, for the environment, whatever, and you are driven by this top down avoid, you know, minimizing human impact, you will never get to maximizing human flourishing. Mm. On the other hand, if we can maximize human flourishing, then the prosperous societies are the ones that can then spend for conservation and, mm -hmm. you know, set yeah. aside and they'll have agricultural systems that are productive enough that every acre doesn't need to be in some kind of agricultural mm -hmm. enterprise, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. it's, and, it's, and so, yeah, it, it's, it seems like we either swing one way or the other. But either we're focused on maximizing human flourishing and economic activity is the be all and end all, which is what I think we've just seen coming through. Um, I guess just before the you're talking about the 70s and 80s with real pushes in environmentalism. And we're seeing that maximizing in, in economic growth in many other countries, China and um, India and Mexico and lots of the South American countries. So. We're now focusing on, I mean, we just had COP27 where they've now, there's been a huge pledge to give lots of money to many of these underdeveloped nations who apply for grants based on um, our climate impact and a huge sort of guilt trip for having developed in this way. So do you see that being sustained or, or coming to a head in some way? Or what, what do you see as the future for that sort of policy? Yeah, I, I guess f rather flippantly, I'll say that this is all smacking of a form of imperialism. So we in the affluent North know better than people living in the developing South about what they should do with their resources. As somebody said, if your choice is between dirty power and no power as a government, what are you going to do? Like yeah, almost 45% yeah. of humanity consumes less electrical power than a thousand kilowatt hours per year. That's a large North American refrigerator. Wow. Think of everything that's per person mm. per year. And think about everything that we take for granted. I mean, the lights, mm. the technology, the everything. And, and so we're going to tell 
con you know, governments, what they can provide for their people based on what I, we are in the situation we are in now and for the next few years because of misguided environmental focus and and you know i that's just something else that i think people need to learn about so when people start saying you know we we have to do this for you know the the planet i just point to germany who's tearing down wind turbines to get at the lignite that's underneath it oh really what what is lignite in? lignite is the worst form of coal you can burn but it's what they've got yeah and they're not going to be, you know, so it, it, mm. we are in this situation because of deeply unserious people. Mm. And, and so let's bring it back to the, the human health and flourishing, because if we can get that right, if we can get our ideas about that right, I'm, uh, I'm optimistic. I'm not naive, but I am optimistic. I think mm. that you know, ultimately well-nourished, properly developed human beings who can communicate one with another can solve all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. The top down doesn't work. It's yeah. got to be, you know, from the bottom up. And that requires a lot of change. And I'm, as I say, I'm not naive about that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what, what, what is the environmental footprint of chronic disease? Well, that, that's a big one. Yeah, yeah. So, so I am becoming familiar with, you know, e efforts within the beef industry globally to work towards sustainable beef systems. Okay. And there's a lot there. Um, but anytime somebody who's serious talks about sustainability, they talk about a societal component and they talk about an economic component and then, and as well as environmental component. An environmental component includes more than merely greenhouse gas emissions, right? Mm. But too often this conversation devolves to only environmental and only greenhouse gas mm. emissions. Well, e and, even even on there, just to, just to jump in, I mean, even the the stat around what certainly ruminant agriculture or, or animal agriculture is contributing to greenhouse gases is far in far more insignificant than what we're being told yeah, in yeah absolutely I, I i mean it's not nothing right it's there it's it's they they've estimated it but in the u.s for example all of agriculture is somewhere around 10 percent of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. That's a um, whole of agriculture rather than just animal agriculture. Yes. Okay. Exactly. And then if we boil it down to animal agriculture, do we know that the, the segment It's less than half. It's about four. Okay. And if we look at beef, it's less than half of that. It's two. So if we, mean, if we cut that out of our diets, not only would be, we be more nutrient deficient in many things, we'd also have a very small impact on the actual climate emissions and we'd have a, a bigger impact on the amount of emissions that are caused from disease related illness yes and um we'd have to increase the emissions coming from plant source food production and it's not a one for one right uh, because the animal source food is more valuable so it would take more to replace it um but um we we also have then the reality that our entire food system is integrated so we can't have sustainable food systems without livestock agriculture in general and ruminant animals in particular so so there's that we would be forced to take more marginal land out of production in order to produce the increased amounts of plant source foods if we look globally and 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 there there was a paper where they tried to estimate what that impact on greenhouse gas emissions would be and i think in the u.s it would be somewhere below two and a half percent reduction but it would come at the cost of they said creating, I would say, exacerbating essential nutrient deficiencies and imbalancing the food system. Mm. Globally, it would be like less than a half a percent impact um, of eliminating animals, 
agriculture in the U.S. And of course, we need to point out that the animals don't get to hang around, right? So they get eliminated. So after the world's largest barbecue, we're left with this <laughs> sort of. And meanwhile, I can pull the paper that estimate that that said that uh, uh, the healthcare industry in the United States is a significant source of pollution, including ten percent of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Now, those aren't apples to apples comparisons, mm -hmm. right? Different methodologies are used to create them. The point is it's there, it's large, mm -hmm. and it's going to get bigger because we know the burden of chronic disease is getting better. Mm -hmm. And we know that the people who are trying to solve that issue tend to bring their mindset of what a healthy diet is. Right. So mm -hmm. they're going to tell people that they need to exercise more and eat less and et cetera. And mm -hmm. we know that that hasn't worked. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, globally, um, there's there's estimates of the the emissions intensity from the pharmaceutical industry alone. Mm -hmm. um, people have taken that number and they've applied it to a dollar figure and said that if you know based on the the pharmaceutical spend for the average american type 2 diabetic sorry the average american adult with type 2 mm. diabetes they gotcha. aren't their disease they have the disease mm. um that if they could eliminate their medication use, they'd reduce their carbon footprint 29% more than if they went from a high meat to a vegan diet. Wow. And we don't hear this at all, really. No, 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 we don't hear that. And so, you know, there's a lot of hand waving in those estimates. I, I admit all that. Mm. Again, the point is, whatever Even if that you number is. It. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, you know, it's like a car's worth of emissions mm. per year. It's mm. like, it, and, and so we we need to have that f more fulsome conversation about this cuz again we're only looking at greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. and and there is the key point we can come back to about biogenic versus fossil fuel methane sources mm -hmm. but on top of that is what is the social impact of people's lives being diminished because they have these chronic illnesses. Mm. What, what is the economic impact? We know it's huge. Then think about, you know, in low and middle income countries where something like 80% of people with these chronic diseases live, mm. right? This is not merely in the high income. It's not confined to the high income countries. Mm. It's, it's a global pandemic. Mm. And, my concern is that a lot of people doing good work in this space are bringing that mindset of, well, you know, if people just ate less or exercised more, they mm. wouldn't get obese. And if they didn't get obese, then they wouldn't get diabetes and all these, mm. you know, like there's so many errors in that train of thought, but it's conventional wisdom. Well, well that, that's what I find frustrating as a, uh, a health professional certainly online, is that people really want to boil down this issue of either obesity or, or being overweight to just calories in, calories out. And that serves some of these big organizations and big companies because it, 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 it obfuscates the truth around what's making us metabolically healthy and what's, what's really making us metabolically unhealthy. And there are people just going crazy at each other online saying, you know, a calorie is a calorie and how dare you say otherwise. And yes, of course, the unit of measurement is the same. You know, it's a unit of energy measurement. You can't really dispute that. But when you combine it with other things and think about the fats and the lipids and how that impacts your, your cells and, and everything in between, there's a lost dialogue there. Yeah. So, so one of my slides says in part, isocaloric diets are not isometabolic. And what do you mean by that? Well, if I could somehow create two diets, one where all the calories come from plants and the other where all the calories come from animal source foods, we know that those would not have the same metabolic effect on the poor human you're feeding the plant. You know, sorry. Um, <laughs> yes, they, they, wouldn't, that. <laughs> they wouldn't evoke the same metabolic response. Mm. And and so, yeah, they, the equal calories, but calories from what you know sugar and starch the plants 
are not, or even, you know, the industrial oil that you somehow process out of plant source components is not going to have the same effect as, you know, those coming from animal source foods where primarily they're going to come from fat. We could say the same thing about isometric diets um, are not where, where somehow we can make protein and minerals mm. the same, right? Are the metabolic effect of those otherwise identical diets are not going to be the same mm. between a plant source and an animal source mm. diet um, for the reasons we've already talked about, uh, bioavailability, mm. let alone the need for some of, you know, things like minerals or vitamins mm. based on what, you know, whether it's a plant source or an animal source or what mm. the nature of those calories are coming from highly processed plant source foods versus, you know, we, we need to get away from calling, you know, the processed animal products and processed plant products are not the same thing, mm. right? Yeah. You can't tell me that prosciutto ham, which is clearly processed, is the same as Pop-Tarts, right? Mm. I, no, sorry, stop, mm. go away, yeah. come back when you've read a little bit more. I, uh, but yet the language that we use mm. kind of leads us there. Mm. Um, so no, we, we, we have to, um, we, we, we have to give people enough information for them, one, to escape this kind of burden of blame that they've been put into by the existing system, right? Mm -hmm. Like nobody wakes up one morning and goes, oh my God, I'm obese. How did this happen? Mm -hmm. Right? It, it's something that we're aware of for a while and we try what we're told to do and it doesn't work. So it must be our fault because everybody's telling us that. And mm -hmm. so we, 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 we wear that coat for a while. And then the, the lucky, tragedy. Yeah. And the lucky ones of us at some point get introduced to information that says, you know, there's, mm. it's not your fault. You know, it is your problem, but it's not your fault. So yeah. where, you know, here's some other information, try this. Here's some better metrics for health. Mm. So track these, figure out what you do, what you need to do within your circumstances, mm. your biology, etc., that, mm. that produces positive changes in those metrics mm. right what makes you happy mm. right if if it's not making you happy why are we doing it yeah. life is far too short mm. and, and and especially if we're you know part of a community people would rather be around happy people than mm. unhappy people so let's you I, find some way mm. i mean i i agree with you there but unfortunately many people's happiness these days is derived from fast food and you know bonding over over poor health habits and well many people yeah. would see that on the on the surface you know short term short term like moment on the lips happiness yeah, yeah but but at the same time i i know physicians and clinicians who serve a variety of you know socioeconomic populations and they have patients that go to, you know, you name the, the fast food chain, they buy the burger patties, mm. right? Or they buy the burger, they don't eat the bun, you know, they eat the patty, they eat mm. the eggs, and, you know, they get better. Yeah. Um, somebody else, uh, I remember, they talked about a patient that would go to um, the all you can eat pizza buffet, <laughs> and scrape the toppings mm. off and eat that. And Good not method. the crust, and mm. they got better. Yeah, wow. Um, a physician that um, I've spoken with talked about a patient who, while living in a tent and cooking on a butane stove, ate the cheap 80-20 hamburger from, you know, the, the, the Safeway supermarket, mm. the lost liter eggs, that's what mm. he ate. He spent $6 a day for food and fuel. Wow. And in, I'm going to say a year, I think it was less, but a safe saying a year, he dumped like 70 pounds of excess body fat, mm -hmm. not weight, and like dumped a bunch of his meds that he was on and metabolically mm -hmm. got healthy. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about 
you know, why, you know, we do have to be concerned about a population with a range of economic realities. Hmm. And, and some of the conversation that frequently takes place leads people to believe, well, if I'm not going to be able to afford to buy the whatever, you know, high brand label claim food, then I just won't try at all. Hmm. And so I'm really interested in lowering the bar to adoption mm -hmm. because I think we have to multiply the personal experiences. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, uh, people put their happiness in the wrong things, but mm -hmm. that can be, you know, people, places, things that mm -hmm. can be, you know, uh, any number of illusions and, and our happiness mm -hmm. needs to come from something else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we're told often that we have so many people on the planet that we couldn't possibly have everyone eating a meat-based diet. So can we feed everyone on a meat-based diet? Well, I would change that because I think it's the wrong thinking. We, we must. It's our moral imperative. So back in the 60s and 70s, there were a group of dedicated scientists who uh, launched, worked on something that we now call the Green Revolution. Um, and, and this is credited with saving a billion people from starvation at a time when that was a quarter of humanity. Wow. Okay. You know, we can quibble and we can argue and I'm willing to have that conversation. But um, uh, I, I as, as a colleague of mine said that most of the people that denigrate that don't seem to have brown skin. Right. Like um, when when you're high up on Maslow's hierarchy, you can afford to cast stones at things when you're starving. You have one problem. Mm. Um, we need a ruminant revolution. We need to sustainably increase the productivity and efficiency of livestock agriculture in general, ruminant animal agriculture in particular globally, mm. so that our brothers and sisters can have the quality. So, so Green Revolution was about calories. I mean, it was about avoiding a caloric insufficiency and yes people thought that you know nutrient but we understand a little better now we need to improve the quality and in some cases quantity as well uh, mm. of humanity's diet i mean we still have this is pre-pandemic fi figures but it's like 800 million human beings are still calorically undernourished uh, oh, nearly nearly a nearly a billion Ne nearly a billion and this frequently has to do with conflict and politics right interfering with the transfer i mean there's enough calories that's not the issue it's getting them to the people that need them mm. but then we still we we also have like 2.2 billion people in the world that are overweight or obese mm. so i count all three billion as malnutrition Sure. So what, we just hit 8 billion. Mm. So, you know, yeah. this, this is a moral imperative for us to do this and we can, it's, it's, it, it takes some people with vision. And right now, unfortunately, we're pushing against the narrative that says we can't, or even worse, we mustn't. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and um, that's got to do with a, a number of things, some of which I understand only marginally. But mm -hmm. part of it is they just don't understand um, that ruminant animals don't compete with humans for food, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that that's not. And, and currently in the world, the majority of human edible crops are produced on s small um, landholder farms in low and middle income countries where the livestock are still an integral component of those mm. farming systems to the point where over half of the world's fertilizer comes from manure. Mm. So you get rid of the animals. Where does your fertilizer come from? Yeah. Well you then, know, yeah. Over half of the world's farmers still depend on mm. draft animals. But, but then, so, but then would that come from things like, um, artificial, uh, fertilizer from the, 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 the fossil fuels industry? Well, if you get rid of the livestock, it would have to. Yeah. 
right? I mean, it, otherwise you're just going to degrade your soil resource mm -hmm. by continually pulling nutrients out and not replacing them. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, plant source foods are a really inefficient way to transfer nutrients from the area of production to the area of consumption. And by 2050, it's estimated that 70 plus percent of humanity is going to live in urbanized areas globally. I can see it. So, I can see that happening. Yeah. So we've got this massive transfer of nutrients mm. from where food is produced to where it's consumed. And the system of getting it back to those regions is really not in place through mo most of the world. Mm. Meanwhile, if we have grazing animals on these air food, you know, production systems, mm. a grazing animal removes far less of what it can, you know, mm in the products that are sold than the commodities and what is provided to humans is far more utilizable and and, and that method of, of farming and agriculture is you're touching on regenerative agriculture there that's one name for it yeah um people have been doing work in livestock cropping systems for years um some very interesting work in areas like brazil for example um, but throughout the Southeast, people have done work that we, we used to have systems that were far more mixed animal and cropping. And for a number of reasons, it's become specialized in Europe and uh, North America. I just saw a post that said that Germany no longer produces enough meat to feed itself. And so wow. what we have now are these wealthy countries that for whatever reason are outsourcing their production to areas where they don't do it as well as their own farmers used to. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so there's a greater environmental footprint there in the new area of production, not to cast aspersions. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. And then you have to transport it. So you've got mm -hmm. that additional burden, but it allows them to feel virtuous while they look down on the people that are in the area, providing them the food that they, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a really sick system. Mm -hmm. um, but even in the U S we have this production of plant source foods that produces byproducts that go to feed livestock. So even though the animals aren't on the farm, mm. they're part of the farm system. Yeah. So another of my lines is you can't get milk from almonds, but you can get milk from almond hulls because those hulls are fed to the dairy cattle in California. It's a major feed resource. Wow. So if you, again, take the animals out, what are you going to do with these waste products of your plant agriculture it, it's it's it feeds into this whole humans getting one idea in their head and then marching seamlessly to the beat of that drum until they're sort of castrated by that thinking at the end of the day you know and then they realize hang on we've got some serious issues in in here in the farming industry i mean i'm just wondering where's the voice of the beef industry pushing back here because we hear a lot from the, uh, the cereals industry and the plant-based industry and these these big grain companies but there must be a beef lobby somewhere well so the one of my twitches is when people talk about the beef industry. It's like, well, you know, we've got 750,000 farms and ranches in the United States that have cattle on their inventory, right? And, and those production systems look very different if you're in, you know, New England compared to Eastern Colorado, for example. Um, and, and then most of those are producing calves that go to somewhere for maybe they run on a stocker operation where they run on high quality pasture, put on more weight, then they go to the feedlot, or maybe they finish on grass and go into the market. Um, but then you have the people that feed calves to slaughter weight. That's a different industry. Then you have people that process and, and that that pyramid just gets small, narrower mm. and pointier and pointier mm. as you go from calf production up to, you know, meat in the case. Um, yes, the, I, I, I mentioned the um, uh, sustainable beef effort. So mm. there are 
a dozen or more national regional roundtables and there's a global roundtable where they're trying to put information out um, and they're also trying to look at ways to improve and do the research you could go to the NCBA, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, they have a website. There's a lot of environmental information there. You can go to uh, whylivestockmatter.org, which is out of ILRI, which is the Institute for Livestock, uh, the, sorry, the International Livestock Research Institute. And they're based out of Kenya and they're doing a lot of good work in in Africa and Asia. So there's lots of resources. But no, I absolutely take mm -hmm. your point that we're not doing a good job. We, you know, as if uh, I'm, I'm a volunteer in this, mm -hmm. right? My my background is my background. Um, I'm blessed by my circumstances. So I'm able to do this, but I'm not in the employ of anyone to do this advocacy mm -hmm. work. Um, not that there's anything wrong with people who are, but we live in an age where people will use that to marginalize mm -hmm. sure. as if the stuff that they're hearing from the other side isn't coming from people who are paid to do it. Yeah. It's a very mm -hmm. weird kind of situation. Mm -hmm. um, I've sat in the audience and listened to people, you know, give presentations on protein quality and apparently, you know, both of these, the, the person giving the presentation and the person sitting next to me were like classmates decades ago. And they're like, well, I remember Professor so-and-so telling us this 40 years ago. Mm. Why isn't this, you know, why is this news now? Mm. So part of, part of it is we certainly in the high income countries, we have the luxury of being really divorced from our food production. Mm. Um, and that should allow us to engage in profitable enterprise <laughs> when we're not like focused on meeting our absolute needs. Um, but that that separation has led to maybe a feeling of disconnection um, certainly made us of susceptible to people with other agendas and messages coming in and getting us concerned. We, we, there's something that I call the outrage industrial complex where people want us to be afraid mm. and, and that's how they make their living. Um, and, and, but then there's just, it's completely reasonable for people to be concerned about their health. And it's completely reasonable for people to be concerned about the environment. And it's reasonable to be concerned about animal welfare. And it's reasonable to be concerned about our fellow human beings. But you couple those reasonable concerns with bad information and you make bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And and now it's we're really behind the curve pushing on it. So I hope that what my role can be is if people choose to eat meat or other animal source foods, I want people to focus on what they need to do for their own health and flourishing. Understand that there's a lot more to the story than we've been told, but you can like relax about these apocalyptic um, stories that we've been told about. And, and, and I want people to own the idea that if you improve your health, you are improving the world. Hmm. And maybe that's the most practical and impactful thing that we can all do. Hmm. And then I think if your experience is like mine, you'll find as you go along that you begin to impact other people's lives. Hmm. And, and then maybe you'll be placed in a position like I was when I realized I had this journey where I reversed prediabetes mm. and, uh, you know, that through diet. Mm. And then I start reading all this and but I couple it with my background and my training. And I find that I have this opportunity to speak to people about both mm. and try to get and, you know, uh, I, I think more and more of us. It, it's not going to come from the top down. No. This has to be, you should pardon the expression, a grassroots movement. See what I did there? I like it. Um, I like it. And, and, <laughs> and 
somebody else gave me the idea of what a tipping point is like it's not 51 percent mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. like eight i've heard a figure of 18 whatever it is mm -hmm. you know you get to that point and all of a sudden you start to see the market say wait a minute you know this has. is there, there's mm -hmm. something here or maybe you know uh, my dream is that in various states, the beef industry is a very important part of the state economy. Mm. And so those people tend to be politically connected. Mm. And the politically connected are those people who understand how to do that. That's not me. I yeah. know that. Mm. Um, but maybe somewhere in that chain is someone who's been dealing with diabetes themselves. Or, mm. you know, God forbid, but maybe they're watching a spouse deal with Alzheimer's mm. and they've never heard the idea of type three diabetes being Alzheimer's mm. or, or maybe they've lost somebody to cancer mm. and they don't understand the metabolic linkage to cancer. Yeah. Right. And, and, but yet they now get that information in part through their experience and they are equipped in position to push this in a mm. way that I would never be able to do. Mm. Well, I, th I think, and, I think the whole thing is, is awareness, isn't it? Like the, the first level is awareness and people being aware that the nutritional information that they've been given isn't perhaps correct and then from there listening to industry voices such as you such as people that i've had on my podcast such as people like belinda fetke who talk about the reasons why we have these miscommunications of what is nutritious for us and then you hope that that, that the voices coming from the top realize that they've been rumbled and that's how yeah, I see it, that they can't possibly rumble. keep talking about how, you know, about how, you know, plant based diets, you can live on a plant based diet and be and be super healthy or, you know, yeah. the, the, the narrative cannot continue because too many people know that it's bullshit. Yeah. So so I just saw a paper. Um, I just printed it out this morning where they're saying that half of your protein needs to be from animal source food. OK. So let's get that out there. Um, I again, I, I I tend not to eat much animal source food, but that's me. Mm. I'm not telling anybody else how to eat. Um, you know, people say that if we got rid of livestock, you know, think of especially cattle. Think of all the agricultural land that we could use to grow mm. crops on. Uh, here's here's an example for you as we wrap this up. Mm. Um, that. If you imagine the Earth's the, the the Earth surface, the dry surface, as a soccer pitch, okay, the bit of that that you can plow up and and plant stuff on, like you know the the pulses and the cereals, and um, that wouldn't even be within the penalty area up to the penalty spot from. Oh, wow. Like, so like not even the, the whole penalty area. Wow. Okay. Because and of, because of, because of what in particular, like sunlight hours and, and fertility of the soil and in depth of soil topography, mm -hmm. um, various limitations. You can't plow mountainsides mm -hmm. and plowing tundra isn't good. And yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a very small amount. Meanwhile, all of the agricultural land, wouldn't even make it from the touch line all the way from, from the goal line all the way to the kickoff circle. Mm. Wow. You'd still be a couple yards short of the kickoff circle. So, so arable land is that really precious resource on which we can produce human edible crops. Mm. But the rest of that agricultural land, the only food producing thing we can do on it is graze livestock mm. on it. And, and we can do that in a way that enhances and protects that resource. Mm -hmm. It's the only food producing effort that we have that can share that in ecosystem with the wildlife that exists there. Mm -hmm. If we're gonna plow it and disc it and plant it, we're gonna dominate it. Mm -hmm. We're gonna completely change it. And we've done that a lot. And mm -hmm. so more of that isn't really a viable choice for meeting the needs of humanity 2050 mm. and beyond. So I, I got this 
quote from a presentation last week and it, it where there is no vision there is no hope so your vision working with the people that you're working with and the people that listen to this podcast you know improving our health span mm. you know being as healthy as we are capable of being you know my friend died when she was 58 of recurrent cancer mm. and i can tell you she was doing everything right in quotes right life happens so this idea that if you eat this way and you exercise this way and all this, you'll get to live to be 300 years old, obviously not, mm -hmm. right? So we, we, we need to grow up a bit in that. And that I think is part of this as well, is people are very frightened of our mortality. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, that's a conversation for another right. day. But, but this idea that we can we can offer this vision to each other mm. and let people walk into that on their own based on their own choices but i just find that a message of hope that more people mm. need to hear so thank you for giving me the opportunity 100 percent. it's been a pleasure to have you on the the one i mean i'd love that sentiment to end on but i really want to ask you if you can give us 30 seconds on lab grown meat um, and your thoughts I can just say margarine, mm. um, you know, lab grown meat. So why would we do that? Well, because some people want to control that source. Mm. And so whatever you're doing in the lab requires energy. Energy is getting more expensive. Um, lab grown meat. Uh, what part, you know, meat is, you know, e e you know, meat is muscle meat. Well, different muscles are different. Which meat are you emulating? Mm. Which muscle, right? Mm. Um, and, and is one of your selling points because it's lower in fat? Well, I want higher in fat, thank you very much. Mm. And I want it to be from animals, not from vegetables. And it's not vegetables anyway, it's industrial seed oil. There's no vegetable involved in that. They named it vegetable oil because vegetables are healthy, mm. right? I mean, no, sorry, stop. Um, and, and, you know, frankly, we can have beef is produced in every state in the nation. So you want local food mm. or do you want centralized food? Mm. So that, that, that's kind of my twitch mm. on uh, the lab grown meat. I love it. I love it. I was, I was about to open a huge can of worms there. Um, <laughs> but, no, I don't eat worms either. <laughs> oh, really? Well, not yet. There, there'll be things coming down the tracks. So sure. <laughs> But Peter, if, if people want to hear more about your work and more about you, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me at grass based one word. Um, that's on in Twitter and Instagram. You can find me on YouTube by name, Peter Ballerstead. Lots of my talks are there. You can find me uh, on um, grass based health on Facebook, o or you can write me at peter.ballerstead at gmail.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Peter, for taking the time. And I hope you've sparked some interest in some of our listeners today. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to speaking again soon. Look forward to it as well. Thank you.